this webinar series, which is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, funded by the Access Scale Computing Project, in collaboration with the U.S. Department of Energy Computing Facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley, Ashley from Oak Ridge, and I will be the hosts for today's webinars, Testing Fortran Software with PF Unit. And the webinar will be presented by Dr. Thomas Kloon from NASA Goddard. Dr. Clone currently serves as the lead for the software integration team with the Global Modeling and Assimilation Office at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and also as NASA's representative of the Fortran Standards Committee. Much of his re recent activities have been focused on leveraging object-oriented features on modern, of modern Fortran to provide Fortran developers with analogs of useful capabilities available in other software communities. He has been working on a number of open source projects, including PF Unit, which is going to be the topic of today's webinar, and uh, also containing templates for Fortran and others. We'll be receiving questions through the WebEx chat and also the Google Doc that we have pasted on the chat in uh, WebEx. And the webinar will have breaks so that uh, Tom can respond to the questions that come in. With that, Tom, please, Ashley, give him privileges. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Osni and Ashley, for the kind introduction, and thank you everyone for attending. I really look forward to uh, discussing this topic with as many people as possible. Uh, so let's see, I need to do share screen. Oh. And then I can make this big. All right, so I think we're good. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so just a very quick outline emphasizing we will be take some breaks. I'm going to start talking about more generic unit testing and testing frameworks. Then we'll have a long section where we talk about some of the detailed capabilities of PF unit and some examples. And then in the final section, which probably will go well beyond the one hour mark, um, which is we're going to do sort of the break and sort of the summary before that. But anybody that can stick around, I encourage them uh, to talk about the last section, which is the part I find the most interesting of all. Okay, so just to ground ourselves, what do we mean? Ooh, that doesn't show the whole screen. We didn't see that. Uh, anyways, um, all right. So today what we're talking about is what the, the community would call verification as opposed to validation. By verification, we mean did we, build, did we build the software right? Does it do the thing that we actually said this software was supposed to do as opposed to have we built the right software? Um, and a concrete example is probably more useful. I, I'm embedded within an organization that does research in weather forecasting. So one example of did we build the software right is can we do a checkpoint restart and get a zero bit difference? That, that, that's the software doing, being built right. The validation is do we get a forecast skill that is sufficient for our scientists to use? All right, so where does this fit into the development process? So we start with some notion of you know, objective reality. Uh, scientists um, form theory, they take observations to create data. Someone posits a mathematical model that gets a little bit closer to something that we can actually do computing with. Uh, to put it onto a computer, someone has to take that model and then discretize it and introduce some approximations that let us do this on a finite machine in a finite amount of time. And then we translate that discretization into an actual software implementation. And then finally, we compile that into an executable. So software verification for the purposes I'm talking about today is this step I've highlighted here. It's going from this discretized mathematical model to a concrete Fortran, in my case, implementation that, that expresses what we want the computer to do. And of course, whenever you're submitting a, a reproducer to a Fortran vendor, you're essentially doing verification for them on the compiler itself, but we're focusing on the other case. Okay, there's lots of things in the world that are software tests, but they're not all created equal. Um, some common ones that I will see in some of the Fortran groups that I worked with before are sort of summarized in this slide. Um, one common thing is to basically put in some condition in the code, and if it's violated, stop the code and make some sort of loud screaming message to the screen. Um, this tells us when the condition is violated, um, it has some bad effects from the point of view of unit testing in that we can't test anything else after that. The code is stopped. We have to start things up again to try anything else. Um, in the second example, um, a print statement that could, you know, we could say that, you know, we want delta mass to be very small from time step to time step, and this print statement would let us know when it gets big. 
Uh, one of the problems with this is that it will get lost in the noise. There's lots of things that are going to stand it out in our model, and this little diagnostic that's wrong will not necessarily be noticed unless someone thinks they need to go look for it. It's also possible the print statement will, will be deleted. Somebody may say, oh, well, we solved the loss of mass problem, they'll get rid of this, and now we've lost that test. And then finally, we have uh, a, a, a situation where the test we want is we want to make sure that the new version of the model with our new infrastructure gives the same results as the previous version. And so we do a long run, we create snapshots from the original version, the new version, and we look at the deltas, and a scientist, a domain expert, now has to go and look at this as, are these differences small enough that they're scientifically acceptable? Um, this stumbles a little bit into the domain of validation, which is not what I'm trying to say here. The point here is that these kind of tests are very expensive and require domain expertise. Um, they're not something we can do routinely, quickly, and by anyone that's using the software. All right, what does a unit test actually look like? So here on the left, I've got sort of the abstraction um, using the terminology from the software engineering world. So the first thing a test does is it sets preconditions, which is just the fancy terminology for saying we're gonna um, set some initial values for some parameters we're gonna use. Then we invoke the system under test, which is just the fancy thing for the thing you're testing. It just is, gets confusing when you talk about the thing that's doing the test and the thing that it is testing. And so you'll see in my slides throughout uh, making reference to something I spell usually SUT, shorthand for system under test. I'll probably just say SUT when I'm in a hurry. All right, then after we've invoked that, we want to check various things are true about the results. So we'll do a check. If it succeeds, we'll continue on to the other checks. But as soon as we encounter a check that is not true, we want to send some sort of alert. This might be a message to the screen. It might be sending an email to an operator, something that, that uh, alerts everyone. And then finally, if there's any resources that have been allocated for this test, we want to go and release those, even if the test fails. So we need to have sort of this branch back at the end to clean up everything that this test created. Okay, so what would be a very, very concrete example of this? Something from our you know, high school freshman physics class. Uh, you have the formula for the position of a particle from an initial position, initial velocity under constant acceleration at time t. All right, so our preconditions are just these values for those parameters, x naught, v naught, a, t naught, t1. And then our system under test might be to call our compute distance function with those parameters. We get a result, x sub t. And then our check could be, we assert that this result should be five. Okay, okay. now I hopefully have done the arithmetic right, someone in my group uh, presumably double check me, so at this point I hope that's right, but if it's right, nothing should happen. If it's wrong, that's when noisy things should happen. Okay, so what are some of the things that we look for in good unit tests? This is where it's sort of more on the art side of things. We want the unit test to be silent on success. It's generally a bad idea to put print statements in unit tests. We want failures to be very obvious. Success should be the norm. We just want a quick summary for successful tests. We want our tests to be automated and repeatable. We want anybody to be able to run them. We'd like to be able to run them whenever we need to. And we'd like to get the same results if we run them two times in a row so we don't confuse ourselves about whether or not there really is a problem. We want the test to be independent. There should be no side effects. What this means in particular, we should be able to run our tests in any order. We should be able to run them forwards and backwards, random order, get the same results. This can be a little bit difficult when you've got some sort of shared service under the hood that everybody's using, but, but it's an ideal to be pursued. We want the test to be obvious, and this is a little bit more um, on the subtle side. You, you can choose any initial conditions you want for your thing. And so you want to try to choose them such that they lead to obvious results. At the same time, of course, you don't want to do something that's tautological. You don't want what you're looking at in terms of the test to be the repeat of the same code that's going to go in the actual application. You want your test to be narrow in the sense that it exercises a very, very small part of your full system. That way, when that test fails, it tells you very much where something went, goes wrong. So a counterexample to this is most of us with complex models do some sort of regression test where you make sure that the new version of the code, um, when we've only produced sort of infrastructure changes, gives exactly the same result. When that test fails in my overnight, I come in in the morning, see that that test failed, it doesn't tell me where in the code that failed. It just told me there's a problem. Now, I might, from the commit logs, be able to narrow it down a little bit further, but it's not useful as a unit test. It doesn't tell me what part of the model actually broke. Uh, we also want our test to be orthogonal. Ideally, if there's one bug in the code, we're only going to fail one test or at least a very small number of tests. 
And then finally, and this is the one that I sometimes uh, have to work a few times with the scientists uh, to, to, to get across. Tests should be very small and frugal. Um, we get very used to declaring physically realistic scenarios. Uh, we want a large array. We want the parameters that take a long time for our solver to converge because those are the physically interesting regimes. But in reality, we want our test to run very, very quickly. An ideal that uh, is expressed by the testing community, and I find is almost always obtainable, is that unit tests should run in a millisecond. Okay? I oftentimes, with my old group, I would pose challenges saying, how small can I make the array in this unit test and have it still be a valid test? And the answer usually is something like 2 by 2, 3 by 3, that kind of category. Every once in a while, a little bit bigger, but it should never be 100 by 100 for a unit test. And of course, in aggregate, we want all of these tests to cover the entire application. Now, this is impossible in practice, but you can get very, very close if you're methodical. Okay. Um, another concept just to keep in the back of our mind that will come up a few times is this notion of a test fixture. Here, the idea is that your initialization involves some fairly complicated logic in and of itself. And that's not the thing you're focused on for the test, but it's necessary to set the preconditions to do the test. So a test fixture sort of is an abstraction that lets you move that logic somewhere else beside the test. Um, it, in addition to setting everything up, it's also a place where you can do all of the teardown so those resources get released. And that, and that teardown step gets called even if um, the test itself fails. Um, it's especially useful if you have a lot of tests that basically need that same initial condition to proceed. And this is a common enough pattern that you know, people came up with this name, test fixture. And then something that often gets used in conjunction with the test fixture are parameterized tests. Here's something where the logic of the test itself is we want to use multiple times, but with just varying values for input parameters and probably varying values for our expected outputs. Um, this could be a useful way for testing, you know, branches. We, we need to run this code once with a negative value, once with a positive value, and once with a value right on zero, so we explore all the different branches that the code might take. Okay. And now, testing frameworks. Testing frameworks are designed to make it easier to build and run tests. Um, so what do I mean about, by that? Um, at the very least, testing frameworks give us sort of a canonical way of doing these things, but they, but they in particular, they come bundled with what you're going to see a lot of examples in a, in a little bit about assertions that let us check the results that we expected in a test in a very, very stylized way. It saves us a lot of coding. They take care of all the boilerplate of letting us know where the test failed. Um, oftentimes, they generate the error message for us in terms of what was expected and so on. Um, they give us a way to create fixtures and to manage fixtures and a way to aggregate our tests so that we can have a whole bunch of related tests and give them one name that's a test suite. Then these frameworks also let us very, very simply run all of the tests that we've created. And when they run, they give us a summary. If nothing went wrong, that's about all we should see. If something does go wrong, the framework then reports the failure locations, the error messages, which test failed, where it was, so on. Um, and the consequence of this is not immediately obvious. Certainly wasn't to me when I first heard about these. There's been a paradigm shift in the last 20 years in testing that I think is largely driven by the, by the existence of these relatively powerful and simple to use testing frameworks. And in particular, we're now in an era where developers themselves are expected to write tests. Prior to this, if you went and looked at commercial software developers, there were usually two teams. There was a team developing the next product, and there was a team of testers that basically had specialized skills for throwing rocks at a product to see whether or not they broke it. Now, they were not looking at the source code. They would try to do everything they could looking at the application itself as a black box. And that is still a very useful skill. But developers are now expected to write tests where they actually do understand what's in the code, and they can be a little more precise. They know that this is a fragile bit of logic here, and they know that they can write a test that exercises that. And because this has gotten easy, and I would argue even maybe a little bit fun, and involves creativity, at least some subset of developers have even gotten to the point where they actually enjoy this part of the process. Um, before, I think you were universally gotten developers getting their CVs ready to move on if somebody had told them they're going to start writing tests. And in particular, one of the consequences of this is the development of a new methodology called test-driven development, which is one of the elements of uh, extreme programming, which was a popular buzzword for a while anyways. Um, it, it's, it's closely related. You also hear people talk about test-first development. And I'll just very, very briefly mention what this is. Here, the emphasis is on a very, very rapid software development cycle that starts with writing a test, not with writing code. You write a short test, 
It should fail because it's to test some new functionality that you want to develop. You then develop the minimal amount of functionality to pass that test. You make sure that it does pass. And if it succeeds, you go on and you create another test. If it fails, then you work until you can get that test to work. And then maybe refactor this. You may, you may have generated some detritus in the process cleanup, and you go on. And the idea is you do this in about a 10-minute cycle, if not even faster. I've, I've seen one presenter that talked about how his group had gotten it down to a sub-one-minute cycle, but they were in an interpreted case. They weren't using comp compilers and such. So if you do this, one of the perceived benefits that you get out of this is high test coverage, because you're never writing any code, and this is already a test that should cover it. Your software is also always ready to ship. It's just a matter of which features you've implemented. If you think you've implemented a feature, it's been tested just in the development process itself. The data is not all there that you might want, but practitioners will argue that there's improved productivity. Um, I think it may depend on, on the person. For me, it improves a lot. I'm a very careless person. Um, the tests themselves form a robust form of documentation. We all know that one of the problems with in-code documentation is that it goes stale and no one updates it. But a test that's going to be always exercised as we develop the code is going to break if it comes out of date, and someone's going to have to go fix it or delete it. So the tests are always there, and they give short little scenarios of how you exercise any given piece of your software. And the thing I like most about this, and this was eye-opening, no one had told me this, but it was obvious in hindsight, is this focus on doing the test first leads you to thinking more about your interfaces and less about algorithms. And so you end up designing better interfaces. And so for complex um, designs, this can actually help, especially somebody like me that has no design background, um, produce something better out of the box. Um, downside, it can be hard to sell this to management. You're talking about making two or three times more lines of code because you're writing at least as much test code as the real code. Um, some people complain that refactoring is more difficult because you're now sort of changing twice as much code. But the practitioners would argue back, refactoring without tests is so risky, how could you even imagine doing it? And, and in particular, that leads to um, a quote by one of the uh, leaders in the software engineering community, a guy named Michael Feathers, who has essentially defined legacy code as code without tests. Um, if you're going to go in and somebody hands you code and you want to work on it, you want to know what you can safely do. And if you don't have tests, there's nothing you can safely do. So you have to understand the entire code before you make that first change. Um, legacy code is therefore very difficult to work with when you're doing a TDD environment. Easy to add new things, hard to fix the old things. And even some of the techniques that Michael Feathers talks about when you do have to work with legacy code really are impossible to apply or nearly impossible to apply to legacy code that's built with procedural programming. Objects give us a nice way of doing some sort of injection into legacy code. Okay, so that's sort of the background before we get into PF unit itself. And so we're going to break and take some questions. Um, uh, Tom, there is a question here that you'll probably <laughs> address later. Will there be a discussion on building PF unit? <laughs> yes. Um, it, it'll be brief. My intent is there's a slide that certainly talks about it, but I hadn't planned to spend time on it. Um, um, certainly, I can come back to anybody that has issues trying to use that slide. So that's all for now. Please yeah. continue. Okay. Okay. So PF unit. So as the introduction already um, told you, this is something that's designed for Fortran. Um, the P refers to parallel, and uh, that's, that's the MPI part. But I want to emphasize for people that maybe you're not in an MPI environment that you can use this completely and just fine without MPI. There's a tiny little bit of open MP in there as well, but nothing very specialized, just, just some things to prevent you from uh, doing some thread unsafe things when using the framework. Uh, the design heavily leverages Fortran 2003 features, in particular object-oriented capabilities. The framework is very extensible. Um, the warning that I will give people, though, is especially the, ver the latest release, which is the beta came out this weekend, 4.0, does require very recent Fortran compilers. Uh, it, you know, the fact that this OO features are still relatively new means that there's still little bugs that can cover it every once in a while. Lately, it's been much better. I've been able to upgrade various versions of iFort without encountering major problems. But having said that, 1903, which I installed at the beginning of last week, does have a problem and cannot currently build PF unit. And I've opened a ticket with them, but there's no analysis of that yet. Um, the, it was itself developed with TDD, so it should have very high test coverage. Um, I sometimes find, fall off the bandwagon when I need to do something quick, but uh, certainly it's, it's pretty good test coverage. Bugs are rare. More often, I counter bugs in the, uh, due to changes in the operating system or changes in the compilers than with the code itself. But they do happen. 
Um, there is a Python-based preprocessor that basically deals with the things that are sort of outside of the realm of Fortran. Um, th these are mostly used to be able to deal with, well, you'll see examples as we get there. You'll want to use it, but I want to emphasize that you can use PFUnit in a purely Fortran way. You'll just find enough boilerplate stuff that the preprocessor gives you that you will want to use it. Um, okay. So some of the things you use the most often are the assertions that PFUnit provides. Uh, PFUnit is especially targeting numerical code. That's what scientists uh, use, are using Fortran largely for. So assert equal is heavily, heavily overloaded for all of the intrinsic types, but in particular for real and complex, I try to cover all of the intrinsic kinds. Um, this part of the code is going to update a little bit. Right now, it certainly covers the five that I list right there for all compilers that support those. Um, I do want to get real 80 in there for the one compiler that also has that type. Um, it supports absolute and relative tolerances, so you can be more expressive about what you mean by a tolerance. Uh, there's also a cert less than, greater than, less than, equal to, greater than, equal to for real types. Um, in theory, it's arbitrary ranks, but because of build time issues, I do currently the default, it stops at rank of five. If you want to build PF unit to work with um, higher rank arrays, it's a very, very simple change in the build step. Um, there are norms, so you can do comparison of arrays that are not element by element. You can do it, you know, L1, L2, and L infinity norm on the arrays. You can check to see if a number is an AND or is finite, so on. And the, the one little um, unfortunate thing here is that, as those of you that are experienced with Fortran know, there's no true exceptions in Fortran. So what I've done instead is I've got a global stack that just grows. Tests, when tests throw an exception, they just put one more thing on the stack and then the framework goes and looks at the stack to see what exceptions were thrown by the test. That means that there's not as much nice stuff in terms of automatically returning you to higher levels of the code and stuff. So users have to be a little bit cognizant of that if they're doing something particularly advanced. For a test that is just one layer, this doesn't really matter. Um, so a simple example of what this would look like in your test. Suppose you wanted to check to make sure that 22 sevenths was exactly equal to pi. Your test could look something like this. And you want to say it better be true to at least one part in 10 to the minus fifth. I actually didn't plug that in, so I don't know if it's that accurate, but I suspect it's not nearly that accurate. Okay. Then you also want to, in addition to be able to specify your post conditions with those asserts, you also want to be able to declare that a given procedure is a test procedure. And so the annotation you use for that is this at test. There's also annotations for at before and at after. This is for fixtures. So an at before says this is a procedure that should run before all of the tests in this file. And at after is a procedure to run after each of the tests in this file. So that's a place to put your initialization and your finalization if you want. Uh, there are parameterized tests if you want to do something more advanced. Um, these get a little more complicated. I'm not going to have time to talk about them today, but if you have questions about that, um, there will soon be a really good example in the demos that I'm going to show you. It's not there yet, um, and I can certainly help you with some concrete examples I have in my own code. There's also a robust runner, and the issue here is that right now, if you use the framework in the default way and your test actually crashes, then you get no results because it crashes before the framework gets a chance to summarize anything. Or if one of your tests hangs, you don't get anything. So the robust runner is an attempt to basically say, okay, I'm going to have a master um, process, not in the MPI sense, but a process that is driving the whole system and then launches tests on a background process. And there was a version of this in 3.x, um, but it was fragile for a lot of people in practice, even though we could never reproduce it in any of the environments that I routinely use. So I've completely rewritten it this time around with a little bit more thought about how this should work. I hope that it's better now, but I think I've already had one report of somebody saying it seemed, seemed to hang for them in one case where it shouldn't have. It certainly works, again, for my tests. Um, I oftentimes found it's not so bad not to have that, though. If you run PF unit with debugging on, it will show you that test that hung because you'll see that it started and didn't finish, or the test that crashed because you'll see that it started and that's when you got the seg fault. Usually it's just one test. You fix that test and then everything's fine and you can stop using the debugging again. I know it's not ideal, but, that, but in practice, I found that to be just about as good. Uh, and of course, uh, I think PFUnit was the first Fortran framework to support MPI. Um, I, I'm guessing by now there are others, but I haven't actually checked on that. MPI tests are themselves just a specialized case, a parameterized test case, where the parameter is the number of processes that you want to run that test on. So it's just a minor extension to the annotation test, and then it takes an optional argument here, NPEs, and you give it an array of the number of processes that you want to run that test on. So this is going to run that test three times, once with one process, once with three processes, and once with seven processes. 
Each, each test gets its own communicator with the right number of processes. And then within that test, there's some handy little things the framework makes easy to get this information. It's easy to get what is the communicator being used for this test, how many processes does it run on, and what MPI rank. You can, of course, make the MPI calls, but those are comparably clunky. Okay. Oh, sorry. Wrong way. Okay. There is also um, a process for what happens to the messages. So any process in an MPI test might generate an exception. At the end of the test, all of the exceptions that have been thrown are gathered onto the root process, but in that process, they're decorated with a little string that says which process generated them. Okay. Um, you also have to be a little bit careful. It's possible to introduce a hang in MPI code if you have a, a handful of asserts in a row and one process fails an exception and the other ones don't and they go on and try to do some blocking MPI communication, then you've got a hang. One thing you can do to prevent that is you can use an MPI assert, which is blocking itself. And so if any process fails the assertion, then all of them fail and you then return out of the code. Um, that can be problematic in other cases, though. So it takes a little bit of awareness about MPI blocking, which one you want to do. In practice, I find this rare. If you have a small number of asserts in a test, you usually don't have to worry about these issues. OK, so as per the question earlier, here's instructions for installing. These instructions are based upon using Git. In theory, and I have to give a big caveat here, there, with the beta release of the software, um, there is a tarball that GitHub automatically generates. But just yesterday, a user pointed out to me one small problem. Git archive does not include Git submodules, and the build assumes that the submodules are available, either at build time checking them out or when you did the clone. So do not try to build 4.0 beta with a tarball. I will be fixing that sometime soon, but currently that does not work. So you want to check out the code, and then you want to switch, so I clone the code, and then switch to, um, I had it the development branch when I submitted these slides, but now that the release is out, you really want to go to 4.0 beta. Um, some of the demos will work better with 4.0 beta. Most of them should work with the developer. But there are a few things that it, it weren't captured yet then. Anyways, the other instructions are too detailed to go into right here. But if you want to try the demos out, you then check out also the demo directory. And that's what we're going to talk about now is what's in those demos. OK, so the first example I call trivial. This is just mostly to make sure you have your environment right. So it's just the minimal amount of code test and build and run that should exercise everything, make sure you've got a correct install, and so on. So there's just uh, a source file, square.f90. I'm not even going to show it to you. All that that is is a Fortran function that computes the square of a real number. The test, though, I'll show you that. OK, uh, shoot, the font, lost the font size. Just a moment while I make this bigger. Sorry, try that again. One more step there. OK, so here's the test. This is the entire file. What you see here at the top is at test. That's something that tells the preprocess, Python preprocess we're going to run, that the next procedure is a test procedure. And so please register it for me with the framework. Then just a regular Fortran uh, subroutine. It has a few uses. In particular, it uses fUnit, which those of you that know the older pfUnit, there's now a distinction. I have a module for just the serial F unit, and there's another module that imports the extra parallel stuff. So this is a serial test, so we just need to use, use F unit. PF unit would have worked, but it then has to link to MPI. And here's our assertion. We are going to assert our expected values first. We expect a result of 9 when we square 3. And this is an optional message that you can do so that when this test fails, this message goes to the user. They get a little more information other than just the line number and the name of the test. If you have multiple assertions that are very similar, this can be useful to let the user know which one of those cases was the one that actually failed. Okay. Then I also provide both a CMake build and a make build option. Uh, I encourage everyone to look at CMake. It's much easier to do a lot of the things we want to do with PFUnit that way. But I did spend some time this weekend to make some reasonably good macros in regular GNU Make to be able to build these examples. And then there's a driver script for both of those. So you can, you can do this all in one step. You can either do CMake and then run, or you can do make and then run. But let me just show you the CMake real quick. All right. So a very short CMake file. This, this is just the boilerplate for the, the package as a whole. You want to bring in PF unit. So you use find package PF unit, and it needs, you have to use it required. You also want to turn on testing because we're using C test to drive all of our tests. 
this is the stuff that's your code. This is the creating a library, the, the SUT in this case. And then you also want to be able to say that uh, the SUT is going to bring, uh, you know, anyway, that's boilerplate. If you don't know CMake, then none of this matters much. That's not the important thing. This is the part you want to see. So for the tests, we have this function from, PF, from the PF unit install CMake. Add PF unit C test. This is the name you want to give your test executable. This is the list of the test sources you've got. In this case, it's trivial. It's just the one. And here's the other libraries you need to link to. So that's the system under test that we defined up here that has the square function. You don't need to mention PF unit, sorry, the, the F unit library because that's already implicit in this fact you're adding a test. So it takes care of most of that boilerplate for you. This will take your, pre your, your test code, run it through the preprocessor to create a Fortran code, and then compile that Fortran code and link it with the framework driver, link it to your other libraries, and produce that executable that you can run. Okay? So, what did, what, oh, I, I forgot that I had done this last night. I apologize. We've covered that. Okay. Let's go on. So, what is the output you get? In this case, the test worked. So you get this very, very minimal output. There's a little dot here. That dot indicates that there was one test run. So just a little progress bar. If you have thousands of tests, it's nice so you can see that things are happening still. It tells us how long it took to run the test. This was a very fast test, ran very quickly. And then we get a success status. OK means it ran correctly. And then a summary, one test ran. None failed. If we had some failed, we'd get more information. OK. So now let's go to a more realistic example, something that suggests some of the more cap real capabilities that are laying around under here. And I apologize, I've lost my mouse again, so give me a second to find it. It is just gone. Let me do this row. There we go. There we go. Okay, so first of all, I have two implementations in this directory. One I called working set, and the other one I called it broken set. And the idea here is that the broken set, when we run tests on that, are going to fail, and the working ones are going to work. Other than that, they're, they're virtually identical implementations. They implement two things. One implements an elemental square function, so now I can square entire arrays instead of just uh, single floating point numbers, and also an integer factorial function that's going to be used to illustrate what happens when you've got illegal inputs. Okay, so let's go to our first example, test simple. And so this is going to just be a whirlwind tour through um, common features that you use. All right, so in this module, again, we have this use F unit that brings in all of the framework capabilities. Um, this first subroutine is not a test. It's in there. You're allowed to call it, but it's not going to be registered with the framework in any way. This next one here, this test is registered, and it does two assertions. The first one is that 1 is equal to equal to 1, so this evaluates to true, which is true, so nothing happens. And then it also asserts false that 1 is equal to 2. Well, 1 is not equal to 2, so that's false. That means assert false is accepted. No exceptions are raised. All right. Uh, then we go down here, slightly more complicated example. Again, we register the subroutine as a test. A common mistake, by the way, is to forget that step and then wonder why your test wasn't run. Uh, you, here's, a, here's an assertion that basically checks that 4 factorial returns 24. And we're use, I should point out up here, we're using the working SUT, so these testers should do the obvious thing, and they will pass if you build and run these. And then the second one checks to make sure that when I square 3, I get the value that I expected. Um, we're do, working with numerical code in this audience, so here's more realistic examples where you're using tolerance. So I can assert that 7 is what I expected, and if I wanted exact equality, I can say 0.0. .0. If I don't specify tolerance, then it is exact equality, but sometimes you want to confirm that you didn't forget about tolerance. And here's another example where I want to say that 7.1 is the same as 7 with the tolerance of 0 0.2. The difference is 0 0.1, so that's fine. And then here's an example where we're using relative tolerance. So instead of assert equal, it's assert relatively equal. And so now 8 is relatively equal to 7 with a tolerance of 0.5 because with a tolerance of 0.5, anything within half of 7, so as much as 11 would have still passed. Okay, so now let's look at some failing tests. Okay, so first of all, now you'll see instead of using the, 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 the working set, I'm now using the broken set. Same interfaces, just broken implementations. You can go look at the code to see in what way it's broken. So 
before we even use any of that directly, though, we can do some simple things. So suppose we do assert true, one is equal to equal to two. Well, that's false, so it's going to fail. And the message we're going to see in the output in a minute, we're going to see that this intentionally failing test, I put that in there so that when someone comes along and looks at my pedagogical examples and the tests fail, they don't come screaming to me that, uh, you know, your demos are broken for the wrong reason. I mean, demos were broken for other reasons, but the tests that are failing, we want them to fail and we want users to see what those error messages look like. Okay. Notice that because this assertion fails, this assertion is not executed. Okay, that's a design choice, but that's the convention among unit testing frameworks. First failure, test is done. If we had real exceptions, we'd have no choice. A real exception would have uh, done a return automatically for us anyways. Okay, um, here's an example with an assert equal that fails. Suppose we said we wanted three, we expected it to square root three to be nine, but this is broken in a way I'm not going to tell you what it is. This tolerance is too tight, and so it fails, and again, this is an intentionally failing test. Here's an example showing um, an assertion with an array. It's a one-dimensional array in this case. The purpose here is to be able to see, even when we look at the output message, you'll be able to see how the output tells you which element in the array is the one that had a problem. Okay. Okay. Um, and in fact, right now, before we, we we'll come back to this slide in a minute, but let's look at the results of the test failing. Okay. So when you run the broken tests, you'll see this output. Uh, this, the sequence of three dots followed by three Fs, that means three tests started and each one of them failed. The test still ran very, very quickly, 0 0.001 seconds. Uh, the, then we see which test failed and in which suite that it's in. Each module sort of usually forms a suite of tests. We see which file it failed in at what line number. And notice the file is not the post-processed from the the Python, it's actually the file you actually edited to put your test in with the .pf substance, uh, uh, suffix. And then finally, any extra messages provided by the developer. So the developer said for this assertion that this is an intentionally failing test, so we get this nice friendly res result printed there. And the next part of the output for the next test, which also failed, again, you see the suite name and the test name, file and the line number. Uh, and now in this case, when you do assert equal, it's a little bit smarter. It knows that you want to know more about what was expected, what was found, and what that difference is. And so it summarized this in a standard way. You see here the expected value, the actual value, the difference, and even a reference to what the tolerance you asked for in it, saying that, that this result was bigger than the tolerance you were looking for. Okay. And then finally, in the, in, the, in the bottom failing test, this is where we had the array failure. It also tells us which index the... Uh, of the array was the first one to fail. So the first one was it within tolerance, the second index was outside of tolerance, and so we see this. And if it's a multidimensional array, then you'll get a, uh, you know, you'll get a multi-dimension, a, a longer list of indices for each dimension. And then at the end, we still get a summary, but instead of saying okay, it now says failures, tells us how many tests ran, how many failures we had, how many errors that would be if you crashed and you're running under robust, but we're not doing that. And then the, the, the command itself exits with a non-zero status, so at least under Unix, this will get registered from, you know, like ctest as a failure itself, and, and we'll, uh, well, not this actually, anyway, it, that's more for the you know, environment in which it's running. All right, so now let's quickly go back to here and talk about test disable. Oftentimes you want to turn off a test temporarily, either for debugging purposes or it doesn't apply in your environment and so on. And there's now several ways to do this, and this list is going to grow in the future. But right now you have these four ways that you can turn off a test. The first is to use an at disabled annotation, and this basically says, please tally this in the summary, but do not run it. And so we don't forget about it that way. You can, of course, also just comment out the at test annotation, in which case then it's not registered and that test isn't run at all, and you might forget about it. And then finally, there's ability to do conditional things. Like you may have a test that doesn't work with a certain compiler or doesn't work in a certain operating system. And so uh, you can do at test and then you can do a pound if def. And this puts in the appropriate logic so that that test is not run when this, uh, when the appropriate uh, pre-processing uh, definition is passed in. And of course, if and def, so you can do the opposite case. All right, so let's look at that real quick, what those look like. And I apologize, this was not as bad the other day. I do not, I'm going to have to Board out to get to my mouse again. Okay. Okay, so here's what the disabled test looks like. This first test is not disabled. It's just an at test. The second one, we, we declared it as a test, but it follows it with the at disable, so it tells us, T 
Keep track of it, register it, but don't run it. This test is still active. This test is inactive and we won't see, it's not even registered, it's commented out. And this one, because we did not do a dash D foo with the preprocessor, will not run. This one will run because foo is not defined. Okay, so we can come back here now and look at the output, which is a few slides down. Okay, this time we ran with the debugging so we could actually see what went on. So you can see with debugging, you get a friendly message at the start and the end of each test. The dot that says the test ran is in the middle of that. When you get to the disabled test, you don't get a start or an end. You just get a notice this test was disabled and you get this I in the summary. And other than that, the test that we asked it to run all ran. So that at the end, we see that it's three tests ran, one disabled. A disabled is not a failure. It's not an error. It's just disabled. It's just commentary so you're aware of it. Okay. Okay. It's an... This is just terrible with the mouse. I don't know what's different today. Apologize to everybody for that. Okay, uh, simple fixture example. Okay, so here we have a test that assumes that some file has been created. This is a really artificial example here, but we have some, for each one of our tests, we have for some reason we wanted to create a file that had these lines, and then we want to check various things. So here's our setup, and we marked it with app before. This is going to run before every test in this file. And then here's our after, and this one's more important. We want to make sure that if our test fails, that that file is always cleaned up. We don't want that file left lying around for lots of reasons. So this is always going to get run after the test. Uh, and here's an example of our test. So we declared it as an at test. We did a find file on test.txt, which should have been created by the setup. And then we checked to make sure that that find file returned the value that we expected. And then that file should get deleted for logic that's not immediately visible here. And then here's a second test, and it, it, the, a new file gets created by a new run of the setup. We do our check, and then that file gets deleted. Okay. Okay. Oop. Where did it go? All right. Now, finally, test error handling. I'm just going to do this one very briefly. Um, one of the things you want to be able to do when you start getting um, regular in terms of doing your unit testing is you sometimes want to make sure that illegal values are also handled. And it's not sufficient to just use illegal inputs and say, oh, yes, my code correctly crashed with an error message. You really want to be able to incorporate that into your unit test and verify that that proper failure scenario is also handled. And so there's a few pieces to this. But the important one I want to show you right now is there's another kind of assertion right here, which is this one. What this, what, what's happening under the hood is that this call to factorial with negative 1 threw an exception itself. And because it's through an exception, you're now asking the framework to check to see whether or not this particular exception has been thrown. If this exception was thrown, then you clear it out. It's sort of a, it's sort of a negative assertion in that sense. If you get the string wrong, though, it'll show up as two error messages, one for this failure and one for the failure to find that failure. Okay? Now, you don't have to make your source code depend upon PF units. There's, there's an injection capability. You can have a default method for what happens when you run your code without the testing framework on. And with the framework, there's a way you can basically say, okay, modify that behavior of that procedure so that when I'm running in the framework, I do this. A little bit of boilerplate. I don't want to delve into the detail. The demos show how that works, and so you can look at that. You can certainly ask me questions about that later. Okay. Okay. So now we can move past these output screens we showed. Okay. MPI. So um, it's sort of hard to come up with non-trivial MPI examples that are at the same time also understandable to bright swap, uh, broad swaths of the community. Um, this has become the canonical one I've tried to show people for a long time. In fact, so long ago I realized as I pulled these tests together that uh, th they were from a version of PF unit that they won't work with anymore, so I had to update all the implementations here. Uh, the idea here is we have a distributed array. It's a 2D array, but it's distributed only in one dimension. And I'm thinking of this from a climate modeling, weather modeling context, where down on your screen is the south, up on your screen is the north. And we have, for each local domain, the local array has an extra set of cells at the top and the bottom. And those are what, in our community, we call halo cells. Some of them call them guard cells. Uh, but the idea is that when I, when I fill in a halo, I should get the information from the neighboring domain and update those cells. And so there's several things we want to check. When we call the halo update, we want to first make sure that we don't modify the interior of this array. That, that, that's sometimes something people forget. And I have seen this mistake made where it got the right 
boundaries, but it actually messed up the internals of the array, and that took a while to spot. And of course, then we want to make sure that we did correctly fill the south, and we want to check to make sure we correctly filled the north. Okay, so what does the test for filling the interior look like? Well, we have to do a little more work now, right? We have to declare our array. Oh, I hope I get the mouse back here. Uh, of course, I didn't, so let me do this again. I apologize yet again. Get the mouse. Okay. Uh, now, when you're doing MPI tests, there is now this this argument. I wasn't supposed to do that. This argument, which is passing in additional information you now need. For instance, the test needs to know the communicator that it's running on. Okay. And the type of this for the simple MPI test, it's just type MPI test method. It's a derived type declared by PF unit that you're bringing in when you do the use PF unit. You're declaring your local array. You're declaring your interior values. Um, uh, just a semaphore here. You then fill this first line, line 63, you're filling the interior value, of, uh, interior of your array with that interior value. Okay. And in our case, we've chosen to fill that with the rank of the process I'm on. That way I know exactly what values I'm expecting my southern border and my northern border. On the south, I expect my rank minus one. In the north, I expect my rank plus one. So we also fill our halos, make sure that they're undefined at the beginning, so that when we overwrite them, we will notice it. And then we call our set, fill halo. And having done that, we can then check to make sure that our interior values have not changed. So you see an, ex an expected value of interior value and a found value where I just passed the interior extents of our array. And I was a good citizen. I put MPI asserts that if it's wrong on any of them, it fails on all of them. That way, if I later on I put some more asserts later on, I won't have uh, broken the test. Okay. Another example. Now we're going to check to see whether or not we filled the south pole correctly. Um, and a, a user actually pointed out that I introduced a – no, this one's okay. Okay. So it looks sort of similar to the first. We're still filling up the array just as we were before. In fact, this is now a, a bad design pattern, right? I should have refactored this and made a setup procedure to do the filling of the array. Um, at any rate, I now call my system under test, fill the halo, and now I check to see what rank am I on. If I'm rank zero, I want to make sure that my halo has not changed because I have no southern neighbor. Okay. You can likewise go and look at, for the other processes, I could have done this in one test, but I did it as a separate test, not all of the other processes. So if my rank is not zero, I check to make sure that my southern boundary has been filled with rank minus one. And now I get the mouse back. Okay. And so what does the output look like? So it's very, very similar to before, except that uh, we now have 18 tests being run. If you, I only showed you three of them, but each of those three tests were being run several times because they were run on different numbers of processes. And we get one of these little dots for progress for every combination of test and number of processes. Okay. And failures would have only looked different in the sense that they would have had an extra little bit in the error message saying which process they failed on. Okay. So just a quick summary of some of the things that are new in PF Unit. Um, I've already accidentally introduced them in earlier slides, but uh, first of all, PF Unit was mostly, 4.0 was mostly about cleaning up the source code. It had gotten a little bit messy over the last 10 years or so, and so I got rid of a lot of detritus things that were fixes for compilers that no one is going to use anymore because they don't work anyways on the new code. Um, uh, essentially, uh, a major rewrite of CMake, which I didn't really understand the first time around when I was using it in PF Unit. Uh, I reduced almost all of the compiler warnings. There's still some there, but it's a whole lot better than it was before. Possibly the robust runner has been improved. And on the more what's new and useful, uh, more annotations, and in particular the annotations are now extensible. So it should be easy for myself and for users to contribute additional things that we want to be able to make tests do. Um, this isn't quite seamless yet, but certainly all the groundwork's been laid and we just need a little bit more um, examples to sort of drive the rest of the development there. Um, the build is better, as I just mentioned. There's now support for what's called the test anything protocol. I had somebody in my hallway thought that was really important, so he worked with me to get that in there. Um, those of you that maybe use the Earth System Modeling Framework, there's a directory now to do subclasses of parameterized tests so that you can run gridded component tests, which are sort of like MPI tests, but just enough different to be uh, hard to implement, so you don't want to do it yourself. Um, 
And then the thing that I'm the most excited about, and really had to sort of restrain myself to not do more on this while I finished up all the other little things that had to get done for the release, is Hamcrest. In some sense, all of the assertions I've been showing you earlier than this are sort of the old way of doing unit tests. They all still work. They're going to keep on being supported. But I'm going to encourage you, as 4.0 becomes more mature, to start using, instead of at assert equals, to start looking at these examples that you see here below. Um, the idea with Hamcrest is that we have a composable system of matchers. So instead of assert equal, you have assert that two things match. And match is a much broader concept than, than, than equality. And what this approach leads to is much better extensibility. People can contribute tiny little pieces of this is a new matcher that does this. And it can then be combined with the other logic that's already there for new combinations of things. Um, one of the other things that immediately comes out of this is the error messages are much, much easier to create and maintain. Each one of these pieces knows how to generate its part of an error message. And so you get messages that come out. It's not perfect grammar all the time, but they come out very, very clear without anybody having to understand the big picture. I understand what each piece, and I'll give examples down here in a minute, each one of them does. And then finally, these assertions read more like the English sentences. And so let's start with that first example now. So here we have assert that x is equal to 5. This is is actually a no-op. It's a matcher that just simply replicates the matcher that's inside of it. But by putting it there, we made this read like a sentence. Before it would have just said assert that x equal to 5. Now it's assert that x is equal to 5. Even better when you go to the next one when you've got the is not. Assert that this is not permutation of. Um, the is not is also going to be smart enough to know to insert the appropriate not in the sentence describing any failures. Permutation just needs to know about this. We don't have to do with the regular old-fashioned assertions. I guess the way to put it is that each assertion overload needed to know about the whole picture to generate the message. This way we can decompose it and get that sort of exponential growth of different combinations of things. What about MPI? Right now in PF Unit 4.0, there is no MPI support for FCAMCREST. I've thought about it. I have a few things that, I, that I'm pretty confident I can do, but there are some issues that need to be dealt with. But what they would look like, I think, is something like this. So we would have assert that X on process 5 with communicator com is blah, 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 blah. The thing I really don't like about this is this com is sort of an ugly thing to stick in there. So I'm still trying to think of a clever way to just <coughs> get that com automatically. And I might end up assuming some stylistic thing on the part of users so that I can just figure this out without the user having to type it themselves. That's TBD. Um, but I expect as soon as this 4.0 beta release stabilizes, I'm going to be putting all of my spare time into extending Hamcrest for MPI and filling out some of the overloads for the um, existing Hamcrest support. All right, so the summary from this, 4.0 is out. Don't use the tarball. Use git clone to get it. There's also a demos repository right beside it. Um, those demos should pass, the ones that have been implemented anyways. If they don't, please contact me. I, I, users have already found a few problems, and I fixed them. They work. Depends on how you built PF unit, you get slightly different issues. Um, and then just a quick summary of what I expect to do with 4.1 now that this is out. Um, I want to get Coalray supported. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward now with Fortran 2018 once you have Coalray teams, but not very many people have implemented Coalray teams yet. So I just need one compiler I have access to to have teams, and I will get that implemented and out there. <coughs> I don't use Cray very often, so it's a hard start for me. And as I said, I'm going to try to get the parallel Hamcrest uh, going here. And that's the next point for breaking for questions before we go on to the challenges. So. Yes, Tom. Uh, we have some questions here. Going back, um, uh, there's a question about documentation. Mm -hmm. where, to find it, where to find the main documentation about PF units and if there are examples of the asserts annotations? OK, so I will admit up front that I am guilty of an all too common sin among software developers that I loathe doing documentation and pretty much have to be, you know, shoved with a sharp pointy stick to do it. Um, that's when it's when presented with the abstract. If somebody asks a very specific question that, you know, how does this work, I can usually very happily sit down and write a paragraph or two about, about that. And then, so it's a matter of then organizing that and putting it out there. My fast way to get the documentation out there was meant to be with the demos. Um, the demos are hopefully cover all of the capabilities of PF unit 
and are well named that will help people go find those kind of things. There is some documentation for the previous version of PF Unit, and it's not terribly wrong, but probably just wrong enough to be annoying to somebody that's coming along blindly. So I do plan to improve that documentation. Um, again, um, sharp pointy sticks help. So if somebody can come to me and saying the documentation for this particular aspect would be useful, that will help motivate me to get at least that part done. If somebody just says, I'd really like to have the documentation be better, I, I, I apologize. It's, 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 it, I, the guilt is all on me, but it probably won't change the situation much. So another question here, Tom, how much validation verification can one do with the short tests? Do you have ways to test errors in parallel implementation execution? <laughs> yes, those MPI tests were running par in parallel execution. So, so certainly, the, you know, the, the question was also about validation. I do want to circle back to that. But in theory, running your tests in parallel is, is no longer a challenge. If you have an environment where you have access to 1,000 cores or 100,000 cores, then you should be able to run your unit tests on 100,000 cores as well. I encourage you to try to write your test to need as few cores as possible because you'd like to be able to run your unit tests on your workstation if you can. You, know, you don't want to use a, 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 a high-end computing cluster if it can be avoided. But there are scenarios where, yeah, your regression tests require that, and yeah, by all means, you can use PF unit there. I have not been using PF unit much at that scale, to be fair. I do most of my unit testing for test-driven development purposes, and these are very fine-grained tests. And we tend to use more coarse grained things like you know, regression tests. Um, does the model produce the same results as yesterday? Do the checkpoint restarts work? Those we don't tend to do with PF unit. Those tend to be sort of scripting to do sort of compare to, to net CDF files, that kind of thing. But there's no reason why it couldn't be used that way. It just hasn't been what I've been doing. But validation, I would not use PF unit for that. Validation is trying to compare against actual data. You're going to spend forever about what is an acceptable thing. The tests get long to run. It's not particularly useful at that end of the spectrum. Okay, oh, so there is an, a question here with the printing, uh, and uh, the 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 question is, uh, you, you know, if the the printing could be as nice as PyTest does. I'm not familiar with PyTest. Maybe you are. So I, I have heard of PyTest. I'm I'm not familiar with it enough to know what the distinctions are. To some degree, the printing here is reflecting what I saw in JUnit, which is oftentimes the reference that I use for my design. I, I, I freely admit that largely I've been following JUnit as it evolves, things that I see and understand on their end that I can incorporate, sometimes it's very hard to follow them, um, I am doing. Some of it is a kludge in order to get things to fit on one line. So some of the things which ought to be on one line, but sometimes file names get very long in some contexts get split across lines. but I certainly am not wed to the particular formatting. And if somebody wants to come along and either contribute something which improves upon it or gives me specific examples of what they'd like to see improved, I'm perfectly fine with that. And I want users to be aware that they should not rely on the formatting of the error messages um, in any detailed way. Uh, PF unit is, is not restricting itself to not change those error messages to be more helpful. Someone that's relying on them to be a particular format could be in trouble. Hopefully, I'm the only one that wrote tests that rely on the format. I have unit tests covering the existing format that makes sure that it is maintained, those tests would need to be changed if I were to put something that looks more like PyTest. But yes, yeah, send me the suggestion of what you want, and I'll look and see how hard it is and where it is in my priorities. Next question. Can you drop into a debugger on test failure? Uh, it's sort of outside of my tools of expertise, but I would imagine something like that's possible. Um, certainly, what, 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 what has been done in the past, but again, this is outside of sort of my, my domain of expertise, so I haven't maintained it. There has, been, there has been a group that put an early version of PF unit and integrated it into uh, Fotran. And so I believe in that environment, there was something like that. It's, but uh, yeah, so if somebody wants to contribute something to help that logic out, it has to be optional, obviously. But I, I'm not opposed to it. It's just I wouldn't know how to go about adding that to the logic. All right, so uh, now, is there a, in quotes, add PF unit C test, close quotes, that works with MPI? Or can you use it with MPI? If so, how? Since C test needs to know that the test has to be executed with MPI run or MPI exec. Yes, yes there is. It probably, it prob I would consider it to be a little bit fragile at the moment. This, is, this just came together. I, you know, users have contributed something along those lines in the past, but I then rewrote it last week. 
um, to make it more modern CMake-ish. Um, and in the in the examples directory, I didn't look at the CMake list file for the MPI example, but in there you will see it being used this way. There, you know, there's multiple optional arguments for the add PF unit C test. One of them is NPEs. And so there you specify NPEs. When it sees NPEs, it says, ah, this is a PF unit test, not an F unit test. And so it links to PF unit rather than F unit. And instead of launching it with just the uh, executable name, it launches it with MPI run. And unfortunately, you know, in theory, CMake handles all the variations of MPI out there, but there are a few things. And so I'm sure that if people start exercising with, with other flavors of MPI and stuff, we're going to need to fix the logic in a few places, but it, it should be more or less ready to go right now. I've been exercising this on my laptop, which is OS X with OpenMPI. I suspect it'll be fine under Linux with OpenMPI, but if you use a more exotic MPI, there might be some little tweaks we have to add to that macro, but it works. Another question. Can I use asserts with the derivative types with type bound compare procedures? Yes. Um, and I have to be a little bit careful here because this is something someone contributed and I haven't looked at closely, but I presume they contributed because um, they were able to use it in their environment. Okay. What I've done in the past, so what definitely works but is not necessarily so friendly, if you define your own equal equal operator, you can certainly do an assert true A equal equal B. That's not so useful because that just tells you whether it's true or false. It doesn't tell you the way that they're different. What you really want is to be able to say assert equal A comma B and then not only have the framework say, oh, when it did the quality, they're different, but then you want it to call something else that's some sort of compare function on top of that. And, and, and I admit that I just not looked closely at what logic this is, in the P, this is in the Python end of it. I've not looked exactly what they do at that point. My guess is all that they did at that point is syntactic sugar. It just is the equivalent of assert, assert true A equal equal B. But please open an issue. Um, that, that would be very, very nice if we can figure out how we want those derived types. We, have, we assume not only do they have an equality test, but also that there's a compare function that will produce a diagnostic message that we would call when they aren't equal, and that message would get incorporated into the error message. That's exactly what PFU should do. Uh, just hasn't been focus of mine so far. So, so Tom, we have a number of other questions here, uh, including one that there is a particular CMake version of CMake for which the installation is failing. Okay. Uh, but what I, what I would like to tell the, uh, the participants is that uh, we are going to ask Tom to go through these questions and for, just for the sake of time, if we don't answer all of them today, uh, Tom, I, Tom, I think, will go over them and, and, and provide the answers. And uh, uh, next week, we'll be sending you know, a curated version of this question and answers to, the, to everybody, to all the sure. people who registered, together with the recording. Sure. So my understanding, Tom, is that you have more material to... Yeah, this is... Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, so, so just then, just for the sake of time, I'll take over for a, just for a, uh, 10 or 15 seconds to announce the next webinar. Mm -hmm. and then I, we get back to you, okay? Ashley, please give me uh, here. So with that, let, let me share my screen here. Yes, for those of you who uh, would like to, to leave us today, uh, Tom uh, still will continue. I'd like to thank you for participating. Uh, we want to improve this series, so if you'd uh, you know, would be, uh, like to get feedback from you, as I mentioned, the slides and recording and all the quest, the, quest, the Q and A will be available at these two uh, sites that I'm pointing to in this slide. And the next webinar is going to be in about a month. And the topic will be, uh, so you want to be agile, strategies for introducing agility into your scientific software project uh, that pre uh, to be presented by Mike Hu from Sandia National Lab Laboratories. And we already uh, open, the site is already open for uh, registrations. Uh, and for upcoming events, there is also this website, xascaleproject.org resources, where you can see what uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, putting in place for you guys. So thank you very much again, and Ashley, you get back to Tom. Okay. Um, all right. So thank you for those of you that are still sticking around. This is going to be a little bit uh, more of a whirlwind, but uh, more philosophical. I enjoy the. I,